Welcome, everybody. So I have a really exciting episode for you guys today. Today, we are going to talk about being a CEO. So with us today, I have Pam Marinko. Pam began her career in sales and marketing in 1988 and is currently the CEO um, of Proficient Learning based in Wilmington, North Carolina. They are a training company involved in innovative sales training and technology, specializing in the life sciences industry. Proficient Learning provides provides a range of products and services, including off-the-shelf and customized sales training programs and their flagship learning experience platform, M-Coach. Um, prior to being at Proficient Learning, um, Pam served as Director of Professional Development for AII Pharma and has worked for several multinational pharmaceutical companies, including Pfizer and UCB Pharma, in various positions including sales, account representatives, corporate sales trainer, education manager, and manager of U U.S. training and development. Uh, she serves as an editorial advisory board member for Focus Magazine. Um, that is published by Life Sciences Trainers and Educators Network. Um, she also contributes to the magazine. In 2010, she was featured in the Wilmington Business Journal as uh, a Coastal Entrepreneur of the Year. Um, additionally, she's involved in our local college, UNCW, here on campus. She is a guest lecturer. She serves as a mentor, and she's also an advisor for the Instructional Technology Program. I mean, super impressive resume. We have a really great guest with us today. So welcome, Pam. Thank you, Ray. It's very, very kind and generous introduction. Appreciate that. Yes, it's it's uh, always fascinating to look at my guests' past and what they've done. One of the reasons I read that is because it's just so interesting to see all this stuff that someone has done throughout their career to get to the point to where they are. I just find that so fascinating. So the first thing I want to talk about today, so you're at Proficient Learning. It's this training company that has grown over years now and has become a successful business. So let's start at, let's start at the beginning. How did you get started? Why, when, and how did you get this thing off the ground? What, what motivated you to do this? So the only part I would have omitted from my introduction was the year I started <laughs> this industry. So thank you very much for sharing that with our guests. <laughs> Um, but that is actually the beginning of the story. So um, when I did start in sales and marketing, and I was in sales pretty much, um, you know, for at least 10, 12 years, I um, moved into the pharmaceutical area of sales. So I was actually one of those pharmaceutical sales reps that you hear a lot about. And I moved pretty quickly through that experience. I became a, a district account rep. I was focused in hospitals. I called on clinics. I called on doctors. And I represented um, commercially promoted products with several large companies. And so it was, a, it was a great sales experience. It was great to see big company workings and best practices and things that they did and how they trained their people and you know how I was trained, how I was onboarded. And, and then I had the opportunity to do a rotation in the home office of one of the companies I worked for. So it was like a, a two year rotation in the corporate sales training department. And they like to do that in this in industry where they bring you when you're fresh from the field and you, you know what it's like to be in the shoes of a rep and then you go into the home office so you can represent that to the new people that are coming into the into the position. Sure. So you can share, you know, firsthand, okay, here's exactly how it feels. Here are some of the questions you're going to receive. Here's here's some ideas around how to respond to that, but that all becomes the training piece. And I think it was during that position when I kind of got bitten, so to speak, by the training bug. Like I just thought that was the best job in the universe was to be in front of new hires, helping to support them, help them look good, help them learn all about our products, deliver strong messages to clinicians, making sure patients had access to that information and the appropriate medical treatments. I mean, that was just like, I couldn't believe they paid me to do that job kind of a feeling, you know? That's always and the best. Well, yeah, it's when you know, work is really not work. I mean, like if you didn't work, what would you do? I would do that, you sure. know? So that was kind of my mindset. And then I, after that position, I, I was promoted into a position where I managed the trainers for an organization that, that was based in Atlanta, actually based in Brussels globally. And so I managed that, the group of trainers, sales trainers for a couple of years. And then after that, I was recruited here to Wilmington with a small startup biotech company. And then I was responsible for not only uh, working with the sales trainers, but also kind of a smaller department, super small company, kind of like a, a department of one or two or three of 
trying to do everything to help onboard sales reps, work with the marketing teams, work with the research teams, and work with everybody and got a real exposure to what does training look like, not just to sales professionals, but also people in other positions with other responsibilities. So that was really, you know, eye-opening and a great experience, worked with phenomenal people at that company. And um, it was just under two years that I was there, they divested of the commercial division. So it wound up being that these people I adored and worked with and had great experiences with were all of a sudden scattered back across the United States and globally, each working with different companies. So, um, you know, we stayed in touch. I was trying to figure out what to do. And in the meantime, I thought, well, I'll just try my luck and see if I can uh, do something in the meantime before I need to find a real job. Sure. <laughs> So um, I uh, kind of hung out my shingle, so to speak. I sent out a message, an email to all of, of my colleagues and, you know, peers and anyone that I'd worked with in the past and just, you know, let them know what was going on and that I was open to consulting opportunities or if they knew of a job that I'd be happy to interview. And it was just kind of a sure. strange, sort of uncomfortable feeling at that moment until I hit send. And then right after I hit send and I, the phone started ringing and I thought – this is kind of shocking that I didn't realize the power of the network and having met so many people and worked with so many people over such a long period of time that they actually did have work for me. And so it started there. And in 2005, that's when the company was born, Proficient Learning. And um, it, it has been, it, it was kind of overwhelming at first and um, kind of overwhelmingly successful. So I had to learn fast. But it's it's still over a long you know fifteen year history. It's it's been a lot of a lot of ups and downs, a lot of learnings along the way. But that's kind of how the whole thing started. So so, so when, long you, when you first started, what was what was the focus of the company? Did you have some clients? Like what were those what were those first clients like? Like was it easy to get? Like you had a comp client and then you started a company, or did you did you have a few clients? Like how did that work? Yeah, it's a good question because I wasn't sure uh, how it would start and who would be my first client, who I would target. Um, that was a little bit of a mystery. So, like I said, when I reached out to this network, it, it went to several different groups of people. So I originally was thinking about the people that I had hired over the years as training vendors. Because, you know, within the company, there's a certain amount you can do yourself, you know, as a training sure. developer. I mean, I can create some workshops. I can create some programs on my own. But given limited time, limited resources, and limited bandwidth, I had to rely on outside vendors to help a, a bit and develop some of those things. So I had some great experiences with some of them that were amazing, that helped me um, look more strategically at the training operations, figure out you know good, solid progression of how to work this through, how to sell it internally, how to you know make sure that the training was high impact and was pulled through and sustained and and then I had some other vendors that were not like that, who, when they signed, you know, I signed on the contract, the dotted line, so to speak. And in that moment, they forgot who the customer was. And that was an unpleasant experience because it was, and I, and I find that's common actually with a lot of people um, that, you know, you, you make an agreement with someone that they're going to deliver certain things and you expect that they will. And then you ask for something and they say, oh, no, that's not included. Or, oh, no, that's extra. Or, oh, you want us to work longer on that. Oh, well, our team's gone for the day. So it's due tomorrow morning. Sorry about your luck. You know, you're going to have to work on that. So those were the experiences that it, it didn't it didn't leave a bad taste in my mouth. It just was more interesting and educational that, oh, some people operate that way. Okay. So when I, I went into this thinking, all right, the first thing I, I would love to do and the first couple of people I heard back from were actually those vendors who had materials that I thought if they just fix it a little, like just align it a little differently or just adjust this one piece, it would really be awesome. Sure. So I decided to offer to help them. And they took me up on that. I had about two or three, my very first clients were other vendors and we were working collaboratively on a project. I kind of came in as a consultant and, um, and kind of flew in under their banner, so to speak, and went to go visit um, the pharmaceutical companies that they had as clients. And I'll never forget this first this first engagement that we had, I went up to the home office with this other vendor partner. We were sitting in this room talking with this corporate trainer. And I just remember thinking, he has no idea what he's talking about. <laughs> like, okay, I used to be the manager 
of that department, but I was not this man's manager. You know, I was a vendor and I needed to remember I am in service. I'm in support of this initiative and I need to check my, my comments, even if it was my inside voice. Um, but I, I remember that project really well. It was, it, it was involved. It was complex. It was a lot of work. Um, but I feel like we delivered really well for the client and I felt like it was a really good collaboration with another vendor who was very open to my feedback and my thoughts. And it was lucrative. I mean, I got the check in, in the mail and I thought, okay, this is kind of crazy that this is, somebody's paying me to do this. <laughs> so, you know, and, and I think then the next couple or three or so that I worked on, again, with other vendors and same sort of situation, I found there was a difference from vendor to vendor in yeah. terms of who actually wanted input and who didn't. Now, did you, have, said, oh. did you have employees at this point or were you, yeah. was it just, this was just you working with these vendors. So, yeah. so, and you guys were creating products that you were, you were selling. Is that how this worked? Is that what you were doing? Yeah. So at the beginning it was me and me and me. <laughs> so, and that's part, it's part of the challenge because you, you don't really know what's going to happen. I never thought, I didn't really think it would last forever. I sure. didn't really think it would become a company. And I didn't really think that I would ever have employees. I just thought this is something I'm passionate about, something I'm good. I, I considered myself good at that. Um, and, so, and and I could help. I mean, I could help make these solutions better and and live out the the mission that I personally had, which is ultimately, if we do our jobs really well, and any, any of us in sales training in the life sciences business, if we do our jobs well, those medical reps are well prepared to educate the clinicians on what are the different approaches to therapy and treatments. And then the clinician is then in a position to make an informed decision for that patient and provide access to care for that patient. And that's the thing that I try to make sure we never ever forget that that's, that's the root of what we're doing. It's why we do what we do. It's why we care a lot about what we do and why it's important. And so I thought, well, there are a lot of different ways to get there. So I was, you know, just me, that, that was kind of leads into the conundrum of being just you. Yeah. That you go out and you sell, you know, like you're making phone calls and talking to people. You're doing everything. Can, yeah. Like I can help you with that. And then, oh, by the way, oh, you want to buy that. Oh, okay. I guess, I guess I need to build that. So I need to build that, make sure that it's right. And then make sure that it goes through all the hoops and the, you know, you get feedback. And at first it can feel kind of personal. And then you just have to get to a point where it's, Nope, it's in the best interest. It's about the content, best interest of, of what we're delivering, not a reflection on me. So let's just make it right for the client. And then, you know, then you have to figure out how to invoice, which was not something I was sure. very accustomed to doing. And um, so having any kind of infrastructure in place, but, but I, I did. I figured out a way to make an invoice sure. and send it. And, um, but yeah, it's kind of like you're literally, like you're doing the dishes, you're, you know, sweeping the floor, you're writing the curriculum, you're selling it, you're collecting, you're dealing with accounts payable, these ginormous companies. And I mean, I'm glad I had the big company experience to kind of warm me up to some of the big bureaucratic processes sure. that there are. And I'm also glad that I had the really, really small company experience to understand what it's like when you are the only person that's really working sure. on it. So how, it, how long was it just you? How long until you were able to start like pulling some people on or did you pull on consultants at first? Like how did that work? Um, that was, well, so the first person I hired was uh, my husband. Um, I talked him into quitting his job. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah. Um, so big risk. It's, it's, yeah. Um, yeah, it just got to a point where you know, I, I was, I was really busy and with a, a lot of different requests and different clients and different things were happening really quickly. And I just, I didn't realize I'd be underwater as fast as I would, was, was sure. just, and tr just trying to get things organized and trying to build some sort of infrastructure or, or something in place. You know, I didn't think I'd need it, but I did. Um, so he actually offered a little coercion, but he, he offered to come in and help me kind of build that infrastructure and make sure that things in the back office were straightened out. Gotcha. Because I, that's, that's something that I think a lot of, a lot of us as new entrepreneurs or new business owners don't realize that that back office piece, how you invoice, how, um, how you manage your operations is a reflection, at least your customers of what the rest of your business sure. is. Sure. Absolutely. So if you don't have that all together, then they're going to think you don't have anything together. So that was kind of a little shocker of a reality for, for me anyway. It was surprising. But 
So that he was the first person and he was a full-time employee. And that was right when we got a group insurance policy for the two of us. <laughs> so, <laughs> you can do that, by the way, for your viewers and anyone else who wants to know. You can have a group with two people in it. Um, so, uh, and then the next person I hired was a 1099 contractor of somebody that I'd worked with in the past very closely and had sure. a lot of trust in. And so she was the next person to join the company. Um, but that was over the first year. So that was, that was pretty lean. Wow. Yeah, that's quick. And that's not a bad problem to be, I mean, it is a problem to feel like you're doing, you have too much on your plate, but it's not a bad problem when you're starting up a company to be, have all this business either. Yeah. So, you know, good, good and bad stuff. Um, so when did you feel like you were, this company was successful? Was it at that point where you were like, Hey, I got to take on my husband needs to quit his job. Was that when you felt <laughs> like this was a success? Like that, I mean, that's a huge risk. <laughs> Um, I mean, yes and no. I think that, I mean, that certainly was a big pivot point. Um, and the, the other thing that happened was I, I, at that, right around that time, I, I found a really great mentor, um, who had come from industry and he had been, um, you know, C-level executive for three or four different pharmaceutical medical diagnostic gotcha. companies. And he, he came from industry as the life sciences industry. He didn't know much about training, but he knew a lot about the industry. Yeah. So the fact that we were operating in that vertical and he could help give me some guidance there. And he'd also run companies before sure. because, you know, I had never been, you know, I had never been a CEO before. As far as I was concerned, I was the worker and, you know, I was just the person getting the job done. So he, um, he helped provide a lot of good insight and, and I, I, I credit him a lot with kind of, cluing me in just just ahead of time of when things were about to go awry. So just before I started to look like I didn't have my act together with the back office, he gave me an analogy that I thought was really helpful. And he talked about tomato plants. So go get, roll with me on this one. So that if you've ever planted tomatoes, the one thing you know is you, you can't just plant it in the ground and expect that it's it's going to grow beautifully and produce fruit. It's going to go all over the place and, and the tomatoes are going to be on the ground and they're going to rot. And it's sure. going to be so if you have a choice, when you, when you have your tomato plant, what you want to do is at the time that you plant it, put that stake in there and make sure that you have a stake in there that's tall enough to support the growth of, of that tomato plant and make sure, sure it's sure. tied in there well so that the vine has a place to go. The tomatoes have a place to, to be and to, you know, ripen. Um, but it protects, you know, provides good fruit. It's upright. It's well, you know, stable and secure. And that's the same analogy that he made about having structure in your business and having the back office settled. If you wait too long and you don't stake it right away, you kill the plant. <laughs> and if you don't stake it at all, you're all over the place and all your fruit's rotten. So I decided, okay, this is better to stake it when you plant it. <laughs> so you put the stake in, and that's that was a good analogy for me at the time. That helped me understand why it was important to have that infrastructure in place and have some back office support. Yeah, so no, I think, I, I, yeah, I can totally imagine having some C level executive mentor you when you're getting things off the ground is a significant. It makes a significant impact in your day to day operations and what you're doing, and really helpful. That's that's awesome that you had that. Yep. Yeah, and he is still my mentor today, so that is wonderful. Um, and I think you know the moment that you that you know it's successful. I think um, it's it's not necessarily all of a sudden that you think, "Wow, okay, this is working." But it it is almost like a like a little bit of a surprise, and you think, "Okay, I have money in the bank. Um, I'm you know I'm doing okay. Things are you know business is relatively stable. I'm dealing with growth problems." You know, so those were some of the indicators that were, I was like, okay, I think this is going to work. I, I think I can maintain this. And, um, yeah, and I do remember there was a, a moment when I made the decision that I was not going to pursue a full-time opportunity at another company, um, like just to go back into industry. Because sure, I sure. think that's the temptation and a lot of people yeah, do that. You know, absolutely. it's like you're, you're, you're in a certain business, you love what you do and it's, it's, it is actually pretty comfortable to be in a company where there's structure, where sure. there are boundaries, you have managers, you have HR, you have IT, you've got, you can call a tech support guy or woman. And when you're in it by yourself, you have to figure out all of that stuff. So there was some appeal to going back into industry, 
And I remember I had a final interview with a training director, like a senior VP of training at a pretty large um, biotech company. I remember she asked me a couple of questions, you know, was I willing to move to the Northeast? And if I wasn't, she didn't want to talk to me anymore. <laughs> and, uh, you know, was I willing to take a, like, a, you know, three levels down because of the size of their organization and come in as sort of a junior level training manager? And I thought, you know, I, I don't know. I, I wasn't sure if I wanted to do those things. Sure, and in sure. the moment when I was talking with her, I thought, you know what, I really don't. And, and I, I think I told her that I was willing to, but then I think I hung up the phone and thought, mm, I don't really want to do that. <laughs> sure. So I, uh, I sent a very, very nice email thanking her very much for talking with me and spending time with me, but that I was you know, electing to pursue something else. So that's kind of how that happened. And at that moment, I hung up the phone and I thought, okay, you know what? I think this is a business. I think we've got something here. So that was a little bit of a turning point. I'm not sure if that's the answer you had in mind. No, that's that's really interesting. So so the company, so you got to this point where you were successful and then where has it, what other changes have occurred since that point? Like what are some big milestones you think you've made? You know, you got first client, you got first employee, you started hiring con. What are the other big milestones you've seen so far? Yeah, and there are probably too many to mention, I would guess, in terms of the number of individual milestones, but I think of it in three big buckets. If I look at the, the lifetime of proficient learning, it's sort of the, the founding piece, which is pretty significant, 2005, is it going to work? It's the first two years being a small business. Sure. Most small businesses don't succeed. Can we operationalize? Can we um, scale this? Can we go beyond just me being an individual contributor and developing every single thing that we're doing. Can we move from Pam Incorporated to somebody wants to work with proficient learning as a company? And so that was the first big move um, in terms of getting, you know, from the walking to crawling to walking to running a little bit and really focusing on what we did very well, which was uh, provide very high level service, make sure we are focusing on those niche markets that are especially difficult to train, which include reps that are calling on hospitals, large systems, clinics, um, those sales professionals that are working in rare disease, very difficult to treat disease states and therapeutic areas. They require a lot more sophistication in the way that they're communicating and the way that they're planning and, and strategically looking at their, their territory and how they're gonna help patients. So that's an area where we focused because there wasn't a lot of training available in that area when I needed it back when. So we focused on that area for the first first 10 years. And that's really, we, we had a, earned a reputation as being a you know white glove kind of boutique provider, very high quality, high service, very successful programs. And what we realized in, um, in about 2015, so like I said, about 10 years, um, what we realized is the thing that was so important too is not just training the, the salespeople that's critical but you also have to make sure that you're training the managers and so the managers can reinforce and support those key messages and make sure that the behavior is changing because just one I, I, you know telling you what you probably already know but just one specific intervention or an event doesn't make training it doesn't make learning and it certainly sure. doesn't create behavior change so having the manager reinforce those those key pieces of information and learnings and over a period of time to make sure that it really sticks. That's critically important. Well, what we realized we've been focusing on that, we've been doing that, but not in a way that was effective or efficient for managers. So several of us having, that I, we'd hired at that point, we had about 15 people, 12 to 15 people at that point. Most of us had come from industry and had been in those management positions and understood acutely that there, there's not one more minute in the day that a first line manager can spend doing something other than what they're doing. So they're charged with developing their people, you know, getting results through others, providing coaching, feedback, interaction. They need to provide that so their people will grow and develop and, and continue to sell more. So in order to do that, they needed to be able to reinforce these skills, but they didn't have a way to, to really package all that together. So that's when we developed MCoach, which is our mobile coaching platform. And it was designed from the perspective of the field sales manager and what that looks like and what that experience is like and what the time is like. So what we wanted to do was make it more of a performance development platform versus just an, okay, check the box. We've been through, you know, I've sat with sure. you, we had this conversation, you did X, Y, and Z and you're compliant, sign here. Okay, good. 
you know, a different kind of approach where it was much more collaborative. You believe it or not, have a conversation with your, your sales professional, talk about what their goals were, talk about their professional development, make sure you're giving feedback in a way that's meaningful, that's high quality, and that actually will move the meter. So we developed that platform in 2015. So it's now been on the market for just a little over five years. Mm -hmm. And so that that is really where the third part of our history comes into play is over the last five years, we've experienced tremendous success and uptake with the platform itself. And fortunately, it is doing exactly what it was intended to do. And there we have managers that that say it saves them one to two hours every day in terms of administrative work and paperwork. And it allows them to really have a more engaging interaction with their salesperson, which is exactly what we wanted. So the other thing we realized, though, is we are sitting on five years of a whole lot of data. And all of those managers, every manager entering those field coaching reports or the field development reports or every coaching interaction documentation, we have all of those amassed over five years. And we also have the company's sales data that they provide us as a separate part of the functionality of the platform. So what we're able to do is look at all of that data analyze that data and understand and determine what are the top managers doing consistently to drive success with their teams. And we look at that information on a blinded fashion. We've partnered with a research organization who has an algorithm and has great scientific rigor, uh, very valid, reliable methodology. And the results are very consistent that we know what the characteristics are of top performers. And we look at that, that, we look at the, who those people are. We put up next to it then afterwards the sales data. So we then confirm they are, in fact, the very top managers within those organizations. And their reps and their, their teams are performing at a, at a rate of 17% more than their underperforming or lesser performing counterparts. Wow, that's pretty cool. Which, for the first time in, in our world, we are able now to show ROI. Sure. Which is, it's like the elusive piece. It's always has been with training. Yes, it's absolutely. How do you, how do you, how can you attribute it to anything? So for us, it's like a, it's a, a little bit of a wheel. So we have MCoach, the platform that gathers the information. It also serves as a learning tool because the managers are using it every day to get better at And the path is set up so that they'll practice what good looks like. Then it yields the data, which we perform the analysts, the analysis and the insights lean from there, which then informs precisely what we need to train. And it's very, very targeted. So we're not spending time on something that is not going to drive drive results or move the meter. So then after the training, they use the platform again, and we get to see how are they doing. So they get to practice these skills on on a pretty consistent basis. And then we look at the output again and measure that. And then we're able to see, did they improve, not improve? Then we can target the training again, and around and around it goes. So that's the story that we just communicated out to our industry. And, and you mentioned um, Life Sciences Trainers and Educators Network. It really is such a thing. And um, we just, I, I made a presentation to the board of directors and the advisory council on these this particular issue. And we also issued a white paper. It was about two weeks ago nice. Nice. that we published that information. Yeah, so it's an exciting time. And it's exciting to be able to share that information with our peers and with, with our colleagues. Yeah, no, that's really interesting. And ROI is one of the, the big things, the big pieces missing from the training industry that's not there. So for those of you watching that aren't necessarily in the instructional design field, it's just something we've been missing in our data and something we were never able to really present to clients. It's it's the big missing piece. So it's nice to see like we're able to use like big data like this to actually start to, to come up with those kinds of numbers. Yeah. So one of the things I thought of as you were going through that, and it was one of the first things you said. Um, so is there a, is there a story behind the name Proficient Learning? Like, how did you how did you think of that? I, I thought of it as soon as you started talking there. I was like, how did she think of the name of the company? Because that's always a challenge. You hear like a bands. They're always like, where did you guys come up with your name? And it's like, or you talk to like a CEO, of some like Apple. And you're like, where did you come up? Like, how did you come up with the name Proficient Learning? We were thinking. Um, trying to think of a name for a while. And this was when I had, I recruited slash drafted my husband to help me. Um, and he came up with it. He just came up with it one day. He said, what about proficient learning? Because it has these, you know, double entendres. Are you learning in a proficient way? Are you creating proficient learning? Is it learning that's profit makes you proficient? You know, so all these 
ways to play on the words. And I thought, you know, that's fun. I mean, we can have some fun with that. And so that's how proficient learning came from his brain. Nice. <laughs> Nice. Just creative brain. <laughs> so I, I always love hearing how people came up with their names for things. I just find that fascinating. So um, moving along into the kind of the next part of this is really talking about like your experience as being the leader, the CEO, the founder of a company. So, you know, we've talked about your company a little bit. Let's kind of get into some of that, like uh, the, the next piece. So what what is it like to, to be a CEO? So walk through like your typical day right now? What is it like? Um, so my typical day, uh, is, is different every day. Um, and I, I think that that's probably one of the good things about the type of work that we do and also the role that I play. Um, and I, you know, in thinking about this question a little bit, um, I remember thinking before I, before I started the company, when I used to work for someone else, I thought, wow, when you're the CEO, you get to do whatever you want. You get to, (laughs) You get to tell people to do stuff. They do things. They, you know, it's like you just sit back and kind of, you know, watch things and make decisions and tell people to do stuff. And that could not be further from the truth. Um, it is, it, it's in fact completely opposite. And I, I've said this before, but I think the higher up you go in the organization, the more in service you are to your people. Sure. And, and I, and I sounds maybe kind of, you know, kind of just off the cuff, but it, it really isn't. I mean, I think, there's, there's no way we can have the reputation that we have. We could have built the trust that we, we have so far and, that, and everything that we've been, you know, had accolades for, or won awards for. And that is a result of the team effort. There's no question about it. I could not do all of this myself. And it's, it's something I think that a lot of people miss. And there are a lot of CEOs that are out there that are, that are kind of pushy and just like to get their way. And people will accommodate. I mean, they'll, they'll comply in the short term, but in the long term, you won't have established a, a, an effective and cohesive team who's really focused on, a, on results and outcomes and things that are going to drive the team and propel the team forward and the organization forward. So if you invest in your team and really make sure that they are whole, that they feel good, they feel supported, they're learning, they're growing, they're being challenged, that is, that is probably the most it's, it's always top of mind, I guess, for me. And, and that's just kind of an important statement, I think, to make. So in terms of, you know, other things that take up my time are things that I would never have imagined I'd be in the middle of. So um, negotiating contracts with companies, dealing with um, medical and clinical and regulatory review processes, going through um, editorial style guides, looking at content and research and making sure that what we're saying, what we're doing, what we're putting out there is current and relevant. Um, You know, I think those are the kind of things that would not have expected. There's a whole slew of things that are administrative and financial that make me wish I had paid more attention in my accounting classes (laughs) in college. Um, But, uh, but yeah, so I, I now understand and thankfully due to a really great, excellent consultant, I have a really good understanding of our numbers. And, and how to build a successful and strong and financially solid organization, which is, is great to, to know and to feel, but it's also great to be able to share that with our team and let them know, look, you, especially in, in this time, you, you have a job, you will have a job, we are stable, we're secure, and in fact, we are growing a little bit, which is different than some of the other companies that are in our space. Um, they're struggling a little bit more. So I think that's part of my job too, is to make sure that I always have my eye on the horizon and I'm looking for what's next and what's around the corner and trying to anticipate what, what challenges are coming, what problems are coming, what do we need to be prepared for? How do we need to ensure that, that we've got, you know, protect our crew first and then deliver our cargo and then get ready for the next journey. And that's, it's kind of in that order, but that's, that's sort of what takes up my time. And just going off what you just talked about a little bit in this time of COVID-19 and coronavirus and everything's just crazy with between education, corporate, government. I mean, everything's just a mess right now. We're, We're very unsure of where things are going. So how has this impacted not necessarily your company? You can talk a little bit about that, but just the industry in general. And what do you think this how do you think this is going to change the future? Like as far as like the way we work in this industry, like what do you think's going to change and going to come from this? It's yeah, I, I think so. It's such a great question. 
to and, and such a good so it's such a good question and it's such an important inflection point in in the business world and just in our world in general people are feeling this very personally and each person's experiencing it differently each company is choosing their path forward in different ways and the longer this goes on the the more evolutions we see sure so I'll just go back to the beginning um, that I remember I was actually traveling the first week. They call it COVID Friday, which I don't know if that's true in every industry, but that was the day, it was the 13th, Friday the 13th of March, that a lot of the companies, the life sciences companies shut down and they didn't allow visitors. They were starting to send their reps at home, trying to get home office people to work from home remote work was becoming a new word and people were starting to get used to that. Um, but that week I was actually in San Diego traveling to one of our, uh, one of our meetings or of our industry meetings. And I remember talking with people saying, Oh, you know, it's it, just keep your eyes shut and it'll go away. And this will, it won't be that big of a deal. And it's only one in a million. What are the odds that it's, one of us is going to get it? And I just, I remember that banter from that meeting. It was about 65 of us or so together in a meeting room for, for, an event, a speaker event. And I flew back here to Wilmington. I thought about that more and started seeing as things unfolded, holy cow, we really have, this is something more significant than that. So as I started to look at that, I thought, all right, this is interesting because it's in our industry, it's a rare inflection point. And, and I think this is true for most, or I think it's true for a lot of companies, but I, I just want to make sure that I say this right. So for our company, this is a big inflection point for three reasons that first of all, and very importantly, there there's been a lot of talk over the years about pharma companies, big pharma life sciences, and the fact that the prices are high, that people are really sure. frustrated with big pharma and big pharma has kind of been associated with negative, a negative connotation. Mm -hmm. And the opposite is true right now at this point in time that as a member and a part of the life sciences industry and what we do and what our mission is, is to get cures and treatments out to patients as quickly, efficiently, and as safely as sure. possible. And that is our mission. So for the first time in a very long time, we are now the hope, the, the future, the promise of the cure and the treatments mm -hmm. for COVID. So this is, a, this is a window. It's a rare time that we need to take advantage of. So that's the first piece in this three-legged stool. And the second piece is, as a training professional, you know, we always talk about how we really want to seat at the table, we want to be heard. Training is really important. Learning and development is critical. Performance improvement, I mean, these are the things that are instilled in us that we want to be heard, we want budget, we want funding, we want buy-in and, and people to understand the value of what we're doing. We have that. We have it right now in a way that we have never had it before. Mm -hmm. Well, we're not just at the table. We are the ones talking and they are the ones listening. They want to hear every word we have to say because the reps are stuck at home. They can't do anything sure. So that, that they're used to doing. It's a completely different world now. So in the remote environment, that's the third part of it, is really being virtually excellent. So mm -hmm. how do we make sure that we are okay we have buy-in to do training and to to push learning and to do it well but now we need to figure out how do we help all of these sales professionals and managers figure out how to do what they do well so selling or coaching and master the technology which they're kind of getting used to mm -hmm. and how do we focus on what's in between which is the technique and that's what's really important to to portray confidence to instill confidence in people and what happened at the very beginning was a lot of people tried and failed and they felt embarrassed and they felt like they didn't look good the lighting was wrong the dog came in behind them it was just really uncomfortable at the beginning and so a lot of people as happens with change is you try it and you fail and you pull back and you go back to what you were doing before and we've seen a lot of that happen so when very early on what we were doing and moving forward leaning in with was creating a, an effective virtual engagement series of programs that we could deliver virtually as easily as possible, make it easy for people to say yes and to access it. We could do deliver it in any one of a number of ways, but we lowered the price for COVID. We just said, 
you know, anybody that wants to buy it, we are happy to sell it. And we developed it really quickly. And I'm, I'm really glad to say that we had a, a lot of people buy into that. And we provided it, again, at a very reasonable price. Um, there are about 6,000 or so people now that have been gone, have gone through that program and been trained on those techniques worldwide. And I think that we've, you know, not just to toot our own horn, but I, I think it's, it's more important that people are getting the skills and they're leaning into it and they're understanding it doesn't have to be like Hollywood perfect. It sure. just needs to be conversational and effective and you need to be able to have the, the conversations. You need to be able to give the information to the clinicians who really need it and in, in terms of our industry. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, those three things coming together at this time gives us a unique opportunity to either take advantage of it or we can shut our eyes and hope that it'll go away. Sure. And so we've chosen the former and it has paid off for us very well. And we're very fortunate now that we've made those decisions and we're looking to what's next um, in the same way. But there are a lot of, of colleagues and friends of mine and other people that were business owners that are not going to emerge from this. Sure. So. Yeah. You know, I, I interviewed a guy, he is in the, in the restaurant business and just talking about how significantly impacted the restaurant business will be in America over the next several years that X percentage of restaurants are probably going to go under and just other industries have been impacted. And, you know, some industries are actually benefiting from this or how are how are companies pushing through this? It's it's a very interesting story to hear. And it'll be interesting to see how this all unfolds and who emerges from the other side when we eventually have a cure or vaccine or whatever happens. Um, it'll be interesting to see. Thank you for sharing that. Cause I, I think that's interesting that, to hear about that side of it. So just a couple more questions for you um, and then we'll wrap things up. So, um, what do you enjoy and not like? What What are the highlights of your job? And what are some things that you just like are like, I really wish I didn't have to do this? So, um, so the highlights of the work, it's really, it's around the work. It's around the work and the people. So when we have a client at the end of any program or facilitation or anything that we roll out, and they are so excited, so happy, so relieved that we were able to deliver something that exceeded their expectations and that importantly made them look good to their bosses. And that's, that's kind of our secret, you know, kind of our private win is that we're the ones that are behind the scenes, helping those people in the corporate environment look great to their bosses. And that is always our goal. And so when we, like we just got an email this morning from a client that is just ecstatic with the program that we rolled out and she's just gushing praise and, calling different people out by name. She sent me a message mentioning all the people that were on the project team. And that for me is the euphoria, the, the hole in one, the, you know, the touchdown, whatever it is, it's that, that great feeling of job well done and awesome work to our team, you know, and that they feel good because they, you know, they got, they worked hard and, and they emerged successfully. And I think that's, so that's like one and one A, you know, is when the client is delighted, and thrilled, they're so happy, they have a great experience. And then the second part is they had a great experience because of our team. And I get to reflect that back to them. So, you know, we send out messages to each other, kind of alerting everyone when we've had a big customer success. We actually call it a, a ring the bell um, email. It's like a, like you ring the, like the, you know, like a, a ship's bell or like a dinner sure. bell or something. You sure. ring the bell in, in success. So we send those messages out so that everyone can can celebrate with everyone else. But I think that's so important to celebrate the successes and let people, you know, be acknowledged and recognized sure. for it. So like for me, those are the big wins and that's what makes it so fun. And that's what gets me through the stuff that I don't enjoy as much, um, which is more, um, they are more the things that I have, have found people that are very, very strong in those areas. So like legal, for example, accounting, finance, sure. Um, IT and technology, some of the areas where I, I really don't have a great depth of knowledge or expertise, and they are able to look at things from an obje objective point of view, reflect that back to me, and help me make informed decisions. So those are the things that I don't enjoy as much. They're not really my strengths, um, but I think pairing that with someone where it is their strength, and they can give me some good feedback, good information, and good recommendations, that is a, is a great combination. It's a way to kind of get around having to do things that I don't really want to do. 
Now, when you find those people like accounting and you mentioned that that's like, you know, you're, you came up in a training background, you weren't an accountant. Like, yeah. so do you find <laughs> it hard to find someone that you can really trust? Because you're not like the, the expert in that. You're not, in, you can't, no one is an expert in every field and you, you have to be able to trust people to do some of these pieces for you. Is that a difficult task to find good people that you can have confidence in that they're telling you trustworthy information? Um, you know, I, I, maybe, um, I, I guess I think, I mean, just in, in terms of that general trustworthy question, the thing I've learned is that, um, you know, most of the people that we've talked with are pretty good at what they do. And when, when we ask them to talk to us about their expertise, it becomes, it becomes pretty clear to me if they know what they're talking sure. about or if they don't. I would say to someone that's, and that's maybe me now, you know, 15 years later, but at the very, very beginning, I think, yeah, I probably um, selected some people that weren't necessarily the best at what they were doing. Um, you know, but I, I would say look for people with many years of experience in having done this, having done that work, whatever it is, if it's finance, if it's the legal work, if it's like, for example, employment law versus contract law, who knew that I would need someone dedicated in each of those areas <laughs> sure. to make sure that we stay, you know, we, we were successful, we were protected, um, you know, like a, a business insurance person, you know, a broker who knows it up and down, in and out, and was highly recommended by a colleague, a friend of mine. So I think maybe that's the safer way to go is, is with a referral base of, of someone that you know sure. and trust who has trusted some of these other people and what experiences they've had. I, I mean, that would be the, probably the best recommendation would be to check references. Did you ever find it, did you ever find it difficult to let some of those pieces go to say like, okay, I'm not doing this component anymore. This person is, was that ever challenging? Especially like as you first, you were doing everything. Was it hard to like, let some of those pieces go? Um, um, so I think there are some things that are easier to let go than others. And it's sort of interesting. It's an interesting question because I felt like I wanted to let go, especially of those things that were not in my sweet spot. So for example, finance or accounting sure. or technology, another good example. And so the, te the temptation is to hire someone, trust in them completely and hand the whole thing over and, and just pretend that it's all going to be just fine and you don't need to pay attention to it anymore. Sure. I think that is, that's the temptation and the risk in doing that is if, if you're not learning along with them, if you're not understanding what they're doing, then that's when things I think can can go the wrong direction. Sure, sure. And that can come back to kind of bite you a little bit. And maybe not intentionally, but just because you're not paying attention to sure, it. Sure, sure. No, absolutely. All right. So if you could go back and talk to yourself when you were first starting proficient learning and give yourself a couple piece of, pieces of advice, <laughs> what would that be? So, um, I actually have thought about this a lot. You know, if I went back in time, would I do this again? I guess, you know, it's one of the questions I think, wow, knowing everything I know now, would I do this again? Because there are a lot of ups and downs. There are, it's a roller coaster ride. It, it presents more challenges than I ever expected. It, it presented more victories and more, you know, euphoric moments than I ever believed were possible. Um, you know, thought of being my own boss was like felt great, then felt not so great, then felt great and felt not so great. You know, so I think there's a lot of that going back and forth. And that's probably the thing that I would, I would try, I, I don't know, I wouldn't have believed it back then, but I, <laughs> I wish I could tell myself that this is a long journey and that just because something is extraordinarily great one day, it's not necessarily the very best thing that's ever going to happen. And just because something is awful and feels horrible, it's not the worst thing that will ever sure. happen. You know, it's it's not the best, it's not the worst, it'll be somewhere in between, and eventually it'll work itself out. And so I think if you, if you care, if you keep your eye on the horizon, you keep your heart in the right place, and you do the things that you know are right, and you do right by people, then ultimately it will smooth out, things will resolve, and you have to make some tough decisions along the way and some tough choices, but in the end, I think keeping, you know, just keeping your eye on the steady, the here, the now, and the later, I think that's what's really important. And it's it's a longer journey than just what's, ahead, what's right ahead of you in, uh, your, in your sight. 
Definitely, definitely. Um, so just one final question. What are, what's next? What's next for you for proficient learning? What, what's, what's coming? So we are working on some really cool stuff. Um, and we, like I said, we, we gave people a little peek into the tent when we were at our annual conference, which was virtual last week. And um, we were one of the virtual sponsors, of course, and um, presented this information about our the Coach technology. We talked about the data and the insights, and we talked about targeted training. We also mentioned that we are partnering with a company who has AI-enabled video coaching, has a platform that we will integrate with MCoach. So that platform, the way that it's built is it's actually designed for practice. So if we think about what our challenge is in training is getting, especially salespeople or anybody really, to role play into practice. So the way this platform works and the tool itself works is you can, you get an assignment, you see an example of what it looks like, and then you record yourself on your iPhone and it has two different pieces to it. The first part is the visual recognition. So your facial expressions and then your tone and cadence and ums and ahs and pauses and that kind of thing. And it gives you immediate feedback. Like, okay, if you spoke a little bit more slowly, maybe that would be more effective. Or if you paused fewer times, it would be more effective. And then the next piece of it is you can enter in keywords to listen for, which in any industry, if you can pick out selected words that you want to make sure that the system is tracking, at the end of the, the, the role play or the experience of practice, you get to see how many times you mentioned certain words. So you, you get immediate feedback on how did you do, how many of these words did you mention, did you, how did, you, you know, did you get it right? And it generally not great the first time. So you want to do a retake. Sure. So on average, people do this six to seven times before they get to the one that they like and that then they submit to their manager or their trainer um, or their field trainer. And so what they're doing is they're practicing and they're coming up with you know how to improve certain things. They're looking at exactly what those skills are that will help them be more compelling, more confident, feel stronger about their messaging, what's important, getting the message across in an appropriate way. And we can gather that information and measure all of that and then provide feedback in a really targeted way as well. So that AI enabled coaching piece, the video coaching piece is really powerful. So we're excited to be bringing that forward right now as well. Yeah, that sounds awesome. I mean, that's really, I could totally use that. I'm on video all the time and critiquing myself consistently. It's one of those skills I tell people whenever I'm teaching or talking about presenting or presenting a proposal or public speaking or anything, I'm like, this is a skill you will improve for the rest of your life. You will never feel awesome at it. You're going to just continuously, (laughs) you're always going to be nervous and you're always going to just constantly improve. You could always make it better so I, I think that's very beneficial really cool to hear that yeah yeah and, and there's the extra added piece of if anybody's competitive which a lot of salespeople are very very competitive so if there's a whole team of people that are doing the same assignment they'll see each other's scores if, they, if you want to allow that but we we did an ex- a, like a sample session in it, and I did a version of it which was not great I will tell you I did it three times over and just to try to improve my score. And then we had one of our salespeople also doing it. She was presenting it to a client and she did hers eight times because she wanted to beat my score. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, this is perfect. She practiced eight times yeah, with that's... this verbiage, this technology, this approach, and, and she's sold on it and, and happy to sell it now. So I think that's just the extra added benefit of you, you always can do better and it's kind of fun to play with. And so that you know it's not going out live until you have a chance to say, yes, I'm ready for this one to go live. You know, that's kind of another side benefit that, that is nice of the technology. Yeah, no, definitely adding some kind of gamification element like yeah. that is definitely cool. So Pam, yeah. you've told me a lot of really good stuff today. I think I learned a lot of stuff from you, and I think people watching this will definitely definitely get a lot out of this. So thank you very much for agreeing to be here today. Well, it's my pleasure. Thank you so much for asking me. I mean, it's fun to think back on these times and try to distill some of this information. It helps me kind of process through it and and kind of reflect back on it too. So thank you. I appreciate it. As I've told people, this is like a time capsule where we're going to be able to (laughs) go back and, and really analyze and critique what we've been doing. So thank you very much. My pleasure. Thank you.